So I wanted to take a moment to encourage some folks. Our high school interns and, high, and college interns from beginning to end came up with that and made that for us. Can we tell them thank you for what they've done? That's awesome. So I have something, you know, that I want to do that you just have to get into this with me. This is going to be ridiculous, but it will help me make a point. So can you just, second service is usually the best about this. Just play along. Just go along with me, okay? Thank you for doing that. So I am a neighbor, and I live on this side of the fence, obviously. This is my side of the fence. And one day I have a new neighbor come, and she moved to this side of the fence. And so I met my new neighbor for the first time. Hey, neighbor. Welcome to the neighborhood. Well, hey. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm Chad. I'm, I'm Tammy. It's so nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hey, Tammy, if I can ever do anything for you on your side of the fence, I'll be right over here on my side of the fence. Sounds perfect. Oh, so nice. So, so nice. a few days later, Tammy came back to my side of the fence and kind of took me up on it. Hey, Tammy, what do you what do you got there? Well, I've got an extra box. You know, I'm moving everything over there, and, and I'm just kind of started running out of room, but I noticed... You have so much room over here, and everything's so neat and tidy. I like and it. I just didn't even think that you would miss that. So I just, it just yeah. made a lot of sense to just bring that over here. I like Thank it. Thank you. Nice and tidy. I remembered what you'd said yeah. about being there. It was just, it just worked out really right. well. Well, that's, I mean, but what if, what if I'm not here and you need your stuff? How are you going to get your stuff? That may not be, oh. you may want to take your stuff back to your side yeah, of the fence. Yeah. <gasps> you can just make me a key. That'll work perfect. Okay. That'll be great. And so I thought to myself, it's just one box. It's no big deal. I'm not going to give her a key, but I can keep her box. And so then a few days later, she came back to my side of the fence. Oh, I dig. Hey, Timmy, what are you doing? What are you doing on my Good. side of the fence? Well, I'm not actually on your side of the fence, but Deeks, Deeks is on your side of the fence, and it looks like he's doing a dookie. <laughs> Good boy, Deeks. Yes, why, why is he doing that on my side of the fence? Why don't you have him do that on your side well, of the fence? Why we have a fence? I know. I don't like that stuff on my side of the fence. It's a mess. Step in it. It smells. Oh, I do a good boy. So are you? I do a good boy. Are you at least going to clean up? His present that's well, on my side of the fence. You know, I what I really like this this relationship that we've got going on. What's on your side of the fence stays on your side, of, and what's on my side of the fence I take care of. And so since that's on. Your, your side of the fence. It's you mine. get it. I mean, it just makes sense. Right. It just makes sense. So a box was one thing. This was something else. And so I decided that I would clean it up because that's what you do. I mean, I, that's the Christian thing to do. I don't want to cause waves. don't want to have any friction. And after all, I, I don't have to be happy about it, but I cleaned up the mess. And I would have been okay with that. But then I felt like I, my neighbor went too far because I was taking a nap on the couch when I heard some noise. And I asked, neighbor, what, what, are, you, what are you doing? Oh, don't mind me. I'm just making Thanksgiving dinner. So, in my kitchen? Well, your kitchen's pretty awesome. <laughs> I mean, it's just great. Everything's right here. It works really, really well. My house is a little small. And I'm not expecting a whole lot of people, just about 50 or so. 50. That's as long as Crazy Joe can get away from his crazy wife's family, you know. Right. So if we can get all them together. Hey, by the way, um, does, this, does this table, like, extend? Do you have some leaves for it or something yeah. to fit all those people? And I'm going to need some more chairs. Do you have any chairs, basement, attic? I'd be glad to get those. Oh, how rude of me. I can get chairs from my own house, I you know, think. Wait, wait. Instead of getting chairs from your house, why don't you have it at your house? Oh, see, my house is so small. It's just so small, and your house is just perfect for this. So I didn't think you'd mind. And, and by the way, mm -hmm. I think it's going to be like a lot of people that you don't even know. So I don't want you to feel awkward or anything. So 
Don't feel like you have to come back. Why? <laughs> oh, Betty, good to see you. Do you have somebody like that in your life? I hope to God that you do not. But if I was to look at this story and ask you, who is the problem in this ridiculous story? My first gut reaction would be, obviously, Tammy's the problem, right? I mean, she keeps bringing her stuff on my side of the fence. That's a problem. And I think that the reality is we all have people who try to bring their stuff and put it on our side of the fence. Maybe it's, maybe it's a coworker who isn't your boss but wants to pretend like she's your boss. And she has a way of kind of undermining you and trying to tell you what to do and put, making you look bad in front of the real boss. And you're like, why can't you? I mean, seriously, there's enough work for both of us. Why can't you focus on your side of the fence? Why do you have to keep bringing stuff on my side of the fence? And it's frustrating and it's irritating. And you, sometimes you just want to punch her. But it, what are you supposed to do? You don't want to make waves. You don't want to cause friction. And what are you supposed to do about that? Or maybe it's a passive aggressive family member. Do you have one of those? That family member who, if they weren't blood relative, they wouldn't be coming to your house. Let's just be honest. Just because they're family doesn't mean that you necessarily want to be with them. Okay, don't act like it's just my family. We all have that family member who they come in and they, they, they can say things with a laugh, and yet it's like driving a stake through your heart. You know, like, whoa, my goodness, look at all these dust bunnies. Watch out, everybody. We're going to have an uh, army come and take us away. You know, stab, stab, you know. Like, oh, kids, you should come to my Annie so-and-so's house. I can make you a home-cooked meal. Bet you wouldn't know what to do with yourself if I did that. Stab, stab, you know what I'm saying? Keep bringing their stuff and put it on our side of the fence. Or the 12-year-old who keeps forgetting to take his homework. And you've put sticky notes up. You've sent reminders. Your nagging alone should be enough to help that kid never again forget his homework. But every other week, it seems like he's calling frantically from school, and you have to leave work. You run to the house, look through the junk pile called his room, find his homework. You drive to the school. You're upset. He's upset. The teacher's upset. Your boss is upset. Everybody's upset. But what are you supposed to do? Your kid is just a kid, and you don't want him to fail. And so what do you do with this? Or maybe it's a friend who keeps bringing his stuff to your side of the fence. And you have a friend. You call him a friend for a reason because you have great memories with this guy. This guy was there for you when nobody else was. You have a great friendship together. But now when he calls, you cringe because it's always something. He's always needing something from you. And it's never enough no matter what you give. It's $10 this time. It's 20 bucks the next time. It's can you help me with this the next time. And maybe it wouldn't bother you so much if you didn't see him driving by in his brand new car with a vanity plate that says you owe me. Right? <laughs> So let me ask you again, who's the problem in these stories? I'll tell you what I want to say. I want to say they're the problem. If they would keep their stuff on their side of the fence, if they could try to put their responsibilities on my side of the fence, then everybody could be happy. They're the problem. But what if in my relationship, as long as I think the other person is the problem, then I've got a real problem. Because when I think what they do or don't do on their side of the fence, what they do or don't do on my side of the fence is the problem, I have put myself in a no-win situation. Why? We said it a few weeks ago. I'm not God. <laughs> I can't control, I can't change what someone else feels or thinks or does. I can't change what they're going to do on their side, what they're going to try to do on my side. I can't stop that. I can't control that. And when I'm making them out to be the problem, I put myself in a position of powerlessness. I've made myself defeated already as the victim. I'll never stand up. I'll never climb out. I'll never be happy. My relationship can never be healthier if I think the source of the problem is on this side of the fence. And what's crazy is, and it sounds like it's condemning, it sounds like it's uncomfortable, it sounds like it's putting us down, but it's not putting us down. It, this is, can actually free us. When instead of seeing the other person and what they do or don't do on their side of the fence or mine as the problem, I see myself as the problem. In fact, Galatians chapter 6 says this can be very empowering. Think about that. When you see yourself as the problem, that's when you're empowered to not be controlled by what you cannot change. Galatians chapter 6 Verses 1 through 10 um, talks about it. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by spirit should gently restore that person. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Verse 2, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. 
If anyone thinks there are something when there are nothing, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man or woman reaps what they sow. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Healthy boundaries are God's way of empowering me not to be controlled by what I cannot change. When I'm no longer trying to fix something that I can't, when I'm no longer trying to take control over someone that I can't, and all of a sudden I say, you know what, the only side of the fence I can take care of is over here, then all of a sudden God begins to empower us to not be controlled by what we cannot change. And it's amazing how that changes us. And it's amazing how even that begins oftentimes to change the relationship and to make it more healthy, more happy, more free. Healthy boundaries empower us not to be controlled by what we cannot change. Because boundaries are like this fence here. In the physical world, we can see the boundaries. The fence shows us where your property begins and ends and where my property begins and ends. Signs like keep off the grass or speed limit, 35 miles per hour. Those boundaries, we can see them. We can say, okay, I mean, I, whether I accept them or reject them, I can see them. I know what they are. Boundaries like walls and, and doors, those show us where you belong and where I don't belong. And, and it helps us see where your space begins and ends. But when it comes to spiritual things, when it comes to relational boundaries, we can't see them. But that doesn't mean they're not as real as this fence that we can see. And in Galatians chapter 6, it talks about one of those unseen boundaries of God that God has created as a natural law in our world. And when we live within these boundaries, we find them incredibly empowering. When we try to rebel against these boundaries, we find them incredibly restrictive. But Paul says this is the law of sowing and reaping. What you sow on your side of the fence, you will reap. Whether it's sowing according to selfishness and that you reap destruction, or sowing according to other-centered love of God and others, and then you reap eternal life that begins now and lasts forever, you will reap what you sow. And that's no one else's responsibility. I'm responsible for what I sow on this side of the fence. No matter what anybody else has done to me or not done to me, even if it was downright evil, that doesn't make it right. But what I choose to let grow on my side, even if I didn't plant it there, is on me. I'll reap that. And what someone else sows on their side, I may care for them. I may pray for them. I may be concerned for them. I may want to offer help to them. But ultimately, what they choose to let grow on their side of the fence is their responsibility. It is not mine. And when two people or when a family situation begins to identify this unseen boundary and allows you to sow and reap what you want to sow and reap, and I sow and reap what I want to sow and reap, then all of a sudden, the relationship is actually empowered to be healthy. And the next thing I know, instead of the passive-aggressive family member coming to me and me seething and stewing and uh, getting all frustrated and stressing out or even before they come and then fuming for days after they've left, then what can happen? I can say this, listen, okay, I'm not going to allow that to affect me. I'm not, I know what she's going to do. I know what he's going to say. I know how he's going to act. I know how that stirs me up, but I'm not going to receive that. They can plant that on my side, but I'm going to dig it up and I'm not going to live with it on my side. I'm going to put it there. And maybe I can just do it internally. And I don't even have to say anything because I'm free. They can do whatever they want, and I'm not going to get upset. Or maybe you're like me, and you can't do that. <laughs> right? No matter how much I want to say, I'm not going to let it bother me. It's not going to affect me. I'm not good at that. And I don't fake it well. Right? And so what it means is you know what the person's going to do and say. And so rather than react, you get yourself ready. Okay. If this happens, I'm just going to very kindly and as lovingly and calmly as I can just pick up that which they've tried to plant on my side, and I'm going to hand that back to them. How do I do that? I say I have to speak the boundary. People can't see it unless I say it. And so I say, listen, I know you probably don't mean to do this, 
whether I believe that or not, I say it, <laughs> given the benefit of the doubt, right? I know you don't mean to do this, but when you say this and this, it makes me feel like this, and I don't want that between us. And you say, oh, you don't know my family member. Oh, friend, I do. <laughs> they're not going to react well, are they? Oh, no, they're going to throw a fit. They're going to push it on you. They're going to blame you. Maybe they're going to cry. That's the worst. They're going to cry and do this whole guilting and shaming thing. Oh, I've been there, done that. They're going to push it all. They're going to try to do whatever they can to get those seeds that you just gave back over here so it'll grow up and you can live in the same misery, the same shame, the same guilt, the same pain that they're living in because they're not going to be satisfied until you do. But your job, no matter what they've done, is to dig it up and say, I'm sorry but that can't grow here. Are you with me? We can't see these. But God says, listen, when you begin to live in them, oh, it frees you. It empowers the relationship to be healthy. So when the 12-year-old calls again and says, Dad, you'll never believe it. I forgot my homework again. And you're like, oh, no, that's so bad. I'm so sorry. That's awful. Dad, can you get it? Oh, Dad, thank you so much for going to get it, Dad. It's really going to save me. I'm going to fail if I don't get it, Dad. And you say, oh, son, I love you so much. I'm not getting your homework. What? No, son, I would rather you fail in middle school than fail in life. Amen? And so I'm going to let you reap what you sow now while it's safe so that you don't have to reap what you sow later and I can't do a thing about to be there to support you. Are you with me? We get to be their parents, which is so much better than being their friends. Oh, amen, Chad, that was good. I just came up with that on the spot. Are you with me? The friend calls. You love them. And you want to do the Christian thing. And it's confusing because he doesn't have. I mean, he has everything he needs to for everything he wants, but he never has enough money for he needs. But you have the extra money, and you feel bad not giving it to your best friend for all these years. And when you're, but yet all of a sudden you realize, wait a minute, he always has his wants. He doesn't have his needs. Maybe I'm not helping. Maybe I'm actually hurting him. And maybe if I love my friend as much as I say I do, the best thing I could do is say, I can't help you with that today. Because to do so would diminish you and make you less than you are. And God intended you to reap what you sow over there and me to reap what I sow over here. It's not easy, is it? But can you see can you see how empowering it is, how freeing it is, how much freer it is not to have all of these built up resentments and anger and hate? You say, you say, I'm just doing the loving thing by just putting up with it. No, you're not doing the loving thing by putting up with it. If inside you're eaten alive, if inside you're screaming, if inside you want to punch someone, right? And so rather... Let God show you how to healthy boundaries empower us not to be controlled by what we cannot change because you can't change them. They reap what they sow. You reap what you sow. But even, even if they put evil on your side and that was wrong and they never should have done it, it doesn't mean by God's grace you have to let it grow and become a part of your life. You can dig that up and put it back where it belongs. But again, this fence is easy to see. In the spiritual relational realm, it's hard to see the boundaries. It's hard to know when do I help, when do I don't. When do I say yes, when do I say no. It's hard to see that. And so the scripture goes on to help paint a picture that helps us see when we step in and when we step out. When we're really helping and when we're enabling. When we have a healthy relationship and when we stepped into a codependent relationship. It shows us here. It says in verse 2, carry each other's burdens and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. And then in verse 5, it says, each one should carry his own load. The word here in burdens means if you, if you could translate it literally to mean a boulder. And so, again, in the physical world, we can see the boulder very easily. We can see the boulder and say, whoa, nobody was meant to carry that alone. But in the spiritual, the relational realm, it's not as easy to see. And so what we're looking for are those things, those situations those problems, those tragedies, those habits, hurts, and hang-ups, that no matter how much a person tried, they would never be able to carry it on their own. They would never be able to get out from under it by themselves. And so as the church... 
the Bible says we fulfill the law of Christ when we come alongside of one another and we help carry the boulder nobody was supposed to carry alone. And when we also allow other people, and this is harder for a lot of us, for me, to come alongside of us and carry the boulder that we can't carry alone. That's what's so amazing to me about what's happening in Celebrate Recovery every Thursday night here at 7 o'clock is right in that room. This, the big room is amazing what they do, but then they go into the small room and they share with each other things that nobody else they thought could hear without judging them. And then all of a sudden they find out these people aren't judging me. These people are helping me carry a boulder that I wasn't supposed to carry by myself. No wonder we do the same thing over and over again and it doesn't fix anything. That's the definition of insanity. Break this insanity and be empowered to let God empower you to come out from under what is holding you down. And the way we do that is allow other people to help carry the boulder. And sometimes it means we come alongside of them. And we don't just say, I'm going to pray for you. We say, I'm going to pray for you by putting my prayer into action for you. I'm going to help you carry that. I'm going to be there for you. And when we do that, that, the blessing box is a great example of that. Doing that in our community. You know, did you know that it is not, God did not leave here and say, I'm going to leave the government to be the savior of the world while I'm gone. I'm going to leave Democrats or Republicans. They're going to be the answer to the ills of human society. God's not interested in whether you vote Democrat or Republican. He could care less. He's interested in whether or not you're a Christian whether or not you are going to live for him regardless of what anybody else does. And that means we come alongside people in our community and we, we don't wait for what the government's going to do. We find ways, small ways, big ways to be a support and help people carry the boulder. You say, yeah, but Chad, I know some people. I've heard stories. They take advantage of the blessing boxes in our community. Yeah, there's always someone who does that. There's people at the doctor's office that shouldn't be there. Taking advantage, taking, making me wait longer because they're not really sick. I know that. People always take advantage of things they shouldn't take advantage of but there's other people in need amen and we can use that as an excuse not to carry the boulder but what we're doing is we're not fulfilling the love of Christ Danny and Glenda heard a story just a couple weeks ago they're taking some stuff and somebody ran up and said I want to thank you for what goes into these blessing boxes she said my husband was diagnosed with cancer. He's been out of work, going to treatment. We don't have income coming in from him now. And the blessing boxes are how we are helping make ends meet because the money we don't spend on groceries helps us get him back and forth to treatment. Why? Because people like you have said, we'll help carry boulders of people we don't even know. That's powerful. It's beautiful. It's hard to let others do that for us, isn't it? But that's what it means to be the body of Christ. When you see a boulder, we're to step in and do something about it. We're responsible to others, but we are responsible for ourselves. So verse 5 says, each one should carry his own load. And the word load here means like a a knapsack. It, It means if in modern terms, we might call it a backpack. And I don't know about you, but I've never seen a backpack made for like four or five people. Backpacks are made for one person to carry. There are some things that no one else is responsible for but me. My feelings, my emotions, my choices, my behaviors, my values, my beliefs. Nobody else is responsible for that, right? Only me. And where we get in trouble in our relationships is when I try to carry your backpack. I'm not helping you. I'm hurting you. I don't love you. I'm disrespecting you. I don't mean to, but that's what I'm doing. And when someone tries to carry my backpack, (laughs) they're not loving me. They may mean well, but really, they're devaluing me. They're diminishing me. They're making me less than. I remember when Kimberly and I uh, were dating, uh, she, uh, it was, we were, we were starting to get kind of serious but not like so much so that we had kind of had any official talk about where this was going or what this meant and so one day I I saw her and I and she was saying hey this weekend I'm going to go up and see my family up in Akron and I said oh cool and and she said yeah and I got in touch with an old friend and I'm going to um, go and, see, and that person we're going to go out to lunch and, or dinner or something and I said oh cool what's her name and she said oh it's not a her it's a him and I thought oh well that's nice a him 
said, what's his name? And she said, well, his name is such and such. And I said, well, yeah, the guy's going to just me. Yeah. She said, going to coffee? No, no, he's taking me to a really nice place. And she named the place. And I'm like, whoa, that's a nice place to catch up with him on college memories. And she said, yeah, he was the nicest guy in college. We were just friends, you know, a really good guy. And, and she said, you know, he played for Kent State. He played football for Kent State. I said, oh, that's awesome. Good. <laughs> That's great. She said, crazy thing. You'd never believe it. He went on to play for the NFL. Hallelujah. That's awesome, Kimberly. Oh, that's great. She said, yeah. And he didn't play, but his first season with the NFL, they made it to the Super Bowl. He has a Super Bowl ring. Oh, that's awesome. You two go have fun. Oh, I'm excited. for. Take a picture. Send it to me. Oh, that's great. That's great. You know, and so I left. She's going on a date with a guy, has hundreds of thousands of dollars, Super Bowl ring, big, strong guy. I'm not at all in th- insecure or threatened by that. Yes, I am. And she should have known, right? Because that's how relationships work. She should know what I'm thinking. She should know what I'm feeling. She should take responsibility for that. She didn't. Horrible girlfriend. And all week long, I'm seething and I'm stewing. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be this jealous jerk. I don't want to be like this. But I am. Apparently, I am because I'm not okay with this. And how can she be okay with this? How can she be okay with a guy asking her out? Yes, she says they're just friends. Does he think that too? Does he know that too? I'm telling you, I know how guys think. That's not what he's thinking. <laughs> and all week long, I'm stewing. And, but I don't say anything because I keep thinking. I'm giving signals. I'm giving hints. But she's not getting it. She refused. Can you believe this? She refused to take responsibility for my backpack. So you know what I eventually had to do? I had to take responsibility for my backpack. And I remember it was Thursday night. The next day she was going to go to work, and then she was going to leave straight from work. And so I said, hey, Kimberly, uh, what are you doing here, Chad? Oh, I just got to, I wanted to talk about your trip. Oh, yeah, I can't wait to see Grandma and Grandpa, Mom and Dad. And I said, yeah, and so-and-so. And And she said, yeah, so-and-so. And I said, you know, Kimberly, Can you ask me how many times I've asked an attractive young woman out just to catch up on college memories? Can you ask me that? And she said, what are you talking about? And I said, Kimberly, he's asked you out on a date. And she said, oh, no, no, we're just friends. It's nothing. And I said, well, I'm sorry. She said, does this bother you? I said, yep, it does. There, I said it. I'm the jerk. I'm jealous. You call it whatever you want, but I said it. And she said, this really bothers you. I said, yeah. She said, I don't have any feeling. I said, I know you don't, but I don't know that he doesn't. And she said, are you telling me that you don't want me to go? I said, nope, nope, I'm not going there. I'm not telling you to do anything. I don't have any say. I don't have any right. I'm just saying that I don't feel good about this because I thought our relationship was turning out to be something more than this and I don't feel good about you being with another guy and I alone and I just I'm sorry I don't and she and she uh she's like well I'll I'll cancel it it's no big deal right and it sounds like a silly example but it's this little stuff in our relationships that go unspoken where boundaries go unspoken and then it builds doesn't it and it grows and then this this little stuff becomes actually not a fence anymore. It becomes a wall between two people, between families, between people in our church family. It becomes this wall where we can't even look at each other. We can't even talk to each other because we're both trying to get each other to take responsibility for our backpacks. And that's nobody's responsibility but our own. And this is not a burden that God's putting on us. He tells this because He made us. He says, I love you so much. I want you to have the best. I want you to be empowered to no longer be controlled by what you cannot change. We have a a small group here that I think really represents the difference between a boulder and a backpack really well. I've asked Krista Coleman and, and Danielle if they would come. Would you encourage them as they come and share today? Come on up. As they're coming, um, back a about right after I first arrived here, Dan, uh, Krista had shared that uh, she had heard of a ministry called Embrace Grace that helps um, single moms be able to feel the love of God and the support of the church family. And so, Krista, would you just share what sum up Embrace Grace and why it's so important to you that we start that here? Okay. Embrace Grace is a pro-love ministry. Um, we just want to come beside the girls 
and let them know how special they are and how much we love them. Um, many churches, um, they support life, but they don't, and, and they, they discourage abortion, but they don't have a program set up. And so the girls leave um, discouraged and alone and scared for the next nine months. And we just want to come behind them and let them know how much we love them and appreciate them and how much we just want to help them and shower them with love. So, Danielle, if you don't mind sharing, how did you hear about this, and why did you decide to become a part of Embrace Grace, you and Blakely? Well, Krista, Krista texted me, and she was like, I'm starting this group, and I'd really love it if you could come. And I was like, okay. Like, I didn't really know exactly what it was, but um, we showed up, and it was just an overwhelming amount of love and support for me and Blakely. And then to learn that this was like God-centered was just mind-blowing because you you think like I've done I've wrecked God's plan I got pregnant I just there's no way that this is right He's not gonna love me and then they're just like He does and it's okay everything's fine. And what has that meant to you? Now you've been in this group about two months. What what is what are something that stood out or something that you feel like? has been encouraging to you well when you get pregnant I was 17 when I found out I was pregnant and um I was very afraid and I was not happy I mean I just it wasn't planned and then um I was like well what and what are people gonna say like I'm not happy that I'm having a baby the greatest gift and then I was I got to the point where I was happy and excited and I was like what are people gonna think about me being excited about having a baby at 18 and then you get to embrace grace and you there's girls talking to you and they're like we were we were in the same spot everything that you're feeling we felt it too and that's normal yeah. and it was just very supportive and calm cleared everything up yeah if I was your dad, I'd be very proud of you. Aren't you guys proud of Danielle sharing this today? And look at Blakely. Is she not beautiful? Yeah. Krista, um, what do you, you do have a way that we as a church family can come alongside and support Danielle and the other who are in the group. Talk to us about that. Well, the number one thing is we could really use your prayers. Um, it's a lot for these girls to undertake, and we just really want God to soften their hearts and draw them um, close to him um, and pray for the leaders that we say and do the right thing. Um, but also, um, part of the draw for Embrace Grace is we have a big baby shower for them. We want them to, we just want to shower them with love, that they will feel God's love and support and um promise them a baby shower there's a higher incidence that will get these girls and um, just to draw them close to God so we plan this big baby shower and we would love if anyone would like to come it's this Tuesday I'm sorry not this Tuesday but November 20th at 7 p.m. at First Christian Church uh, First Christian Church partnered with us not um, awesome that we have another church in the town that's working with us and us with them yeah um, anyway we're having it at 7 o'clock clock on the, the 20th and uh, we would like to invite anyone who would like to come whether you bring something or, or not um, we have a uh, gifts or uh, invitations out there that there's a RSVP if you could just let us know if you're coming and um, we can get you the gift list or if you just want to make a cash donation that's great too but it would be wonderful for everyone to come and just support these girls and just show them God's love that's awesome so in the back at the welcome table, there's a um, wrapped box. Yes. And they can put a don financial donation in there. Yes. Or they can get the RSVP um, invitation that the greeters are going to pass out as they leave. Yes. And they can come to that. They can call you all, and you'll tell them about the gift. And they can. Wouldn't it be cool if we just had all kinds of folks show up to that baby shower and just show them that we are for them and we celebrate them? Wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah, that would be awesome. So... Let me, um, let's pray. Let's pray for Danielle and Blakely, Krista. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much. Lord, it is exciting to see that your church family here doesn't wait until we as a church say, yeah, that's going to be an official 
ministry of Crosspoint. But they understand that we all have a ministry we're called to. And Krista has gone after this. And she and Janet White from First Christian Church, they have gone after this. And they said, let's see what happens. Let's see what we can do with this. And I thank you for putting that on their heart. And I pray you would encourage them and strengthen them as they lead and as they raise up other leaders for this. And then together, Lord, we thank you so much for Blakely and for Danielle. And God, we believe that this little girl, you have a plan for her life. There is is no accident. You know exactly why you wanted her here and how you're going to use her to not just be a blessing now, but to lead others to see your love and your light in their life. And together as a church family now, we lift up Danielle for you, Lord, to you, Lord. We ask that you would encourage her, that you would strengthen her. That, Lord, on the days when she thinks, I don't know if I can keep doing this, that, Lord, you would send even one of us along her path to encourage her and lift her up. And that this baby shower that they have would be truly an expression, and they would receive it as such, a true expression of your visible love right in front of them. And it would just overwhelm them in a way that encourages them for years to come. In Jesus' name we pray.